I am a professional. I always aim true whether firing single rounds or full automatic. I know neither fatigue nor failure. I would take pride in my work but for one thing. I do not know my target. I am not the one who kills. That distinction belongs to the man who pulls my trigger. I am an assault rifle. My name is Kalashnikov. Somewhere near Moscow, a group of elite soldiers from Russia's interior ministry are about to start an all-day exercise. In the morning, they line up in formation. According to tradition, they pay homage to past comrades who've died in the line of duty. This unit has taken part in many counter-terrorist operations across Russia. They have a variety of firearms at their disposal, but their weapon of choice is still the Kalashnikov assault rifle. To these men, it's known simply as Kalash. These soldiers will endure a course of special training lasting almost until dusk. It's regular procedure for new modifications to the Kalashnikov assault rifle to be tested in such units. It would be hard to imagine a tougher testing ground for any new gun. One rifle from every batch is thoroughly scrutinized before being sent to units in the field. In truth, it's more like torture than a scientific trial. The rifle's designer, Mikhail Kalashnikov, once recalled that when he realized his first model was to be subjected to a severe test, he looked away. He couldn't bear to see it with his own eyes. Testing a new variant of the Kalashnikov goes through seven stages. First, the gun is placed into what's known as the dust chamber, where the room is filled with sand. The dust chamber is filled with fine particles of silica sand. The next stage will lead us to the sprinkler room. It imitates a subtropical climate. When US commandos fought in Vietnam, the hot and humid conditions often prompted them to improvise with captured Kalashnikovs rather than their own army-issue M16 rifle. Kalashnikovs were far more durable in such a climate. Self-taught gunsmith Mikhail Kalashnikov came up with the prototype for his celebrated rifle at the age of 22. He set about designing it after he was wounded in action during the Second World War. Recognition of his achievement came five and a half years later in 1947, when his model came first in a Defense Ministry firearm design contest. The new weapon was designated AK-47. I took care to think over every single part to make them more technologically suitable for mass production. At the same time, I needed to make sure that the gun was as reliable and durable as its design dictates. That was not an easy task. In general, any designer must be very careful with regard to every detail of the design. Vietnam War veterans frequent this firing range in the U.S. state of Virginia. It was here in the 1990s, after the end of the Cold War, that the AK-47's designers met their American M16 counterparts. Following the gathering, Mikhail Kalashnikov put his signature on one of the rifles belonging to the club. This is Russian ammunition, by the way. So it, I'm sure it'll work well. General Kalashnikov autographed this piece, so this is uh, quite a rare piece. And when we shoot it, I'm gonna, everybody will have on white gloves because we don't want to smear the, uh, the signature on. Kalashnikov assault rifles are mainly assembled by hand. People working at the Izhmash machine building plant in the city of Izhevsk never say weapon or assault rifle. They refer to it simply as the product. Some 20 variants of the AK have been turned out here since 1947. People across the globe instantly recognize the Kalashnikov. It is the most widespread firearm in the world today. The rifle is not only functional, but it's also a handsome model. Mikhail Kalashnikov likes to say that it cries out to be touched. Most of the workers at the machine building plant are women. It's thought they handle the mechanical operations requiring constant attention better than men. 
They know the rifle inside and out, even though the weapon is intended primarily for men. I often have to teach male workers, not only the newcomers, but also those who already know their job well. When I watch films on TV, I instantly recognize something made in our shop. It gives me great joy to see our products on screen. The first batch of Kalashnikovs made in 1947 was kept secret. So much so that officers concealed the weapons in cases and collected used cartridges. When the 5.45mm variant appeared in 1974, the situation was quite different. The Kalashnikov brand had gained fame far beyond Soviet borders after the Vietnam War. Special forces were some of the first to appreciate the benefits of the 5.45mm version. Shot patterning had improved, it was also much lighter, and there were no complaints about harsh operating conditions. Even though the Kalashnikov rifle is much more reliable than the M16, its designer earned far less from his creation than his American counterpart, Eugene Stoner. They came from completely different socioeconomic and political backgrounds. In Russia, Kalashnikov was honored as a national hero, a regional icon, but received no compensation. Stoner received a dollar a rifle for uh, a royalty. Of course, they sold millions of them. And so, in the United States, few people know who Stoner is, although he became wealthy from this. In Russia, many people know him, but he didn't become wealthy for it. Different approaches, different societies, different values. New recruits at Russian military schools are required to learn how to strip down the Kalashnikov in 15 seconds. Then, within the same time limit, the gun must be reassembled and ready to fire. This is a reliable weapon. It's a personal weapon that all students must have a good knowledge of, down to the smallest part. Sometimes they even have to take it apart and reassemble it and clean it while they are blindfolded. Cadets who have successfully passed initial tests take an oath of allegiance. The ritual goes back to the mid-17th century, and since the 1950s, it's featured full-dress uniform and a Kalashnikov. I, Cadet Ignatyev, do hereby swear allegiance to my country. After taking the oath, cadets are duty-bound to use their weapon to protect Russia's interests. Kalimambu means thank you in Mozambique. The words of the song sung by these freedom fighters could just as easily be addressed to Mikhail Kalashnikov. In the early 1960s, the Soviet Union helped the Portuguese colony in its fight for independence. The rebels quickly got a feel for the Soviet rifle. After their victory, it became a national symbol. You see, in the middle of our, our flag, we have here the star and uh, the book, the hole, and the Kalashnikov. The book signifies education, and the whole, uh, our potential agriculture, uh, for, uh, and uh, uh, the Kalashnikov, uh, the struggle for liberation of our country, and the start of internationalism. In Soviet times, the Ashevsk machine building plant worked around the clock in a bid to uphold what was then called internationalism. The employees joke that because everyone at the plant works like robots, if they were ever to find another job, even at a factory making meat grinders, the end product would still be a Kalashnikov. After spending eight years at this conveyor belt, I can work with my eyes closed. In the week, they have regular jobs. But at weekends, these people change their stuffy office suits for battle dress. Laptops give way to Kalashnikovs. But these weapons are loaded with plastic balls instead of bullets. The plant is now making a Kalashnikov with a difference. Some call them fake because they can't kill. 
but everything else about these non-lethal rifles remains true to the original. Its weight, design, and appearance. Now, everyone can feel like a real soldier. It's not a fake, but rather a genuine Kalashnikov. Basically, this is the first attempt in Russia to use an electric mechanism to adapt a combat weapon to a game of airsoft. This thing is assembled from the same materials and on the same production lines as regular Kalashnikov assault rifles. This game, played by people fed up with the routine of everyday life, may look pointless. But in fact, the purpose of each round of airsoft is to achieve real tactical goals. Army units are likely to use airsoft in the future as a cost-effective method of tactical training in close quarters combat. For the time being, though, Men and women alike are only just beginning to get their hands on this non-lethal version of the iconic Kalashnikov. I'm not very strong because I'm a young woman. When I first began doing it, my hands ached a lot. But now I feel they have been getting stronger with each training exercise. I find that holding that thing is less of a problem now. There is another side to the popularity of the Kalashnikov. As one war comes to an end, arms dealers rake in huge profits by buying up used Kalashnikovs and selling them in other hotspots. For example, after the Soviet Union pulled its troops out of Afghanistan, a single rifle cost a mere $15. Today, the price for a functional Kalashnikov in the Middle East is around $1,000. We use this rifle as the main weapon of our struggle because it never misses targets. The Kalashnikov has proven its reputation in combat and demonstrated its sturdiness in complex conditions. In the 1980s, the CIA supplied the Afghan Mujahideen with thousands of Chinese-made Kalashnikovs. It was the first time that Soviet-designed weapons were used against Soviet soldiers. In the 21st century, however, those same firearms have now been turned against the United States. Many Al-Qaeda gunmen fight NATO forces using the very rifles that the US bought for them so long ago. Cadets at Russian military schools are undergoing weapons training on a tank range. Mikhail Kalashnikov himself began his military service in Russia's armored division. Before the AK-47, his first inventions were related to armored vehicles. But they could not be implemented because of the onset of World War II. Kalashnikov miraculously survived after being wounded when his tank caught fire. As a result, he couldn't resume active service. And so he devoted all of his efforts to designing small arms. <laughs> 